welcome everyone to this uh, trimester's first uh, talk in the Durham Geometry and Topology Seminar. So it's a pleasure to uh, have Lawrence uh, Mouillet. Is that, I hope I pronounced it. Uh, Mouillet. Mouillet, okay, thank you. And uh, in, in, our, uh, in our seminar, and he just recently moved to Rice uh, University in the US, and he's going to talk about torus actions on manifolds with positive intermediate Ricci curvature. So, thank you so much. And um, uh, thank you, Fernando, for the invitation to speak. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about um, some of the work that I did during uh, uh, my thesis work at University of California at Riverside. And um, I'm going to be talking about, of course, torus actions and positive intermediate reach curvature. So first, I'd like to start with an overview of the area that I'm working in. So this is global Ramadan geometry. So the goal is to find connections between the geometry of a space and its underlying topology. So um, what I'm particularly interested in is uh, curvature lower bounds. If I have a lower bound on um, sexual curvature, Ricci curvature, something like that, um, what does that tell me about topological information for the manifold? Okay. And so what are some standard uh, sort of classical results in uh, this vein? Well, we have Meyer's theorem, which says if a, I have a closed Riemannian manifold and I have positive Ricci curvature, then the fundamental group needs to be finite. Okay, so for example, I can't have something like my manifold being diffeomorphic to a submanifold cross a torus. So when I'm studying torus actions, uh, uh, situations like this are going to be ruled out if I'm expecting positive Ricci curvature. Okay. Another classical result is Singh's theorem, which says if I have a closed, uh, positively curved Riemannian manifold, um, when the dimension is even, then the fundamental group needs to be uh, zero or a Z mod two. And when the dimension is odd, the manifold needs to be orientable. So uh, positive sectional curvature is a uh, stronger condition than positive Ricci curvature, uh, which we're seeing here. And for example, if I have RPN cross RPN, then the fundamental group is going to be Z mod 2 cross Z mod 2 in the appropriate dimension. And um, this is an example of a manifold that has uh, that cannot have positive sectional curvature, but it can have non-negative sectional curvature. You're allowed to have, um, uh, there are some zero curvature planes for this manifold with the, the usual product metric. Okay, so uh, this is really one of the only um, obstructions that we have between positive sectional curvature and non-negative sectional curvature. Um, there are no known obstructions for the classes of manifolds that have positive versus non-negative sexual curvature if you assume uh, simply connected manifolds, right? We don't have any examples of simply connected manifolds that have non-negative sexual curvature and cannot admit positive sexual curvature. And there's even a famous conjecture along this line which is one of the Hopf conjectures. And it asks, can S2 cross S2 admit positive sexual curvature? And um, people generally believe that the answer to this is no. But um, there's, there's been no, of, of course, there's been partial results along this line, but um, nothing concrete yet on um, to the affirmative or negative. All right. And then another really big theorem in this area is Gromov's Betty number theorem, which says if I have a closed connected positively curved manifold, positive sectional curvature, then the sum of the Betty numbers is bounded above by some constant um, that's dependent upon the dimension. And so that shows that, for example, if I take a product of spheres and I take uh, a connected sum with itself and I do that over and over again, eventually the some of the betting numbers are going to be too large and this will not admit positive sexual curvature. This cannot admit positive sexual curvature by this. But it does admit positive Ricci curvature by work of uh, Shaw and Yang. Okay. 
So that's a bit of some background in this area. And so what I'd like to move on to next is what, we're, what is called the Grove Symmetry Program. So uh, Carson Grove in the 90s uh, suggested the following uh, objective to classify positively curved manifolds that have large isometry groups. Okay, and this has uh, gained a lot of traction because it's allowed us to get lots of results in global Ramanian geometry. So classify, you can take to mean whatever you want. So this could be up to diffeomorphism, up to homeomorphism, up to homotopy equivalence, so on and so forth. And large isometry groups, um, I necessarily put these in quotes because you can take that to mean whatever you want it to. So large isometry group could mean that if I take a look at the isometry group, I could ask that the dimension be large. Or I could take a look at the manifold and its orbit space with respect to the action of the isometry group and ask for that to be small the dimension to be small. Or I could take a look at the isometry group and ask that the rank, which is the largest, uh, which is the, the dimension of the maximal torus in that um, Lie group, I could ask for that to be large. And that's exactly what we're going to be working with today. OK, so some motivation for Grove Symmetry Program is the classification of positively curved, simply connected homogeneous spaces. So this is due to the work of lots of people. And um, a lot of uh, their work was done in the 70s and 80s, I think. And then uh, Wilking noticed a, um, a gap in uh, Berger's work with one example that was left out. Um, so he's included in this list. And if you want to see um, an overview of this classification, you should check out the uh, 2015 survey by, or not survey, article by Wilking and Ziller. Another motivating example for the Grove Symmetry Program is the um, Shane Kleiner theorem, which says if I have a closed four dimensional manifold, it's positive uh, sectional curvature. And if I have an S1 action um, that's effective on, on my manifold, then it should be diffeomorphic to a four sphere or a complex projective space. OK, so for example, how this is useful is, remember, our hop conjecture was uh, can S2 cross S2 have positive sectional curvature? And a partial answer to this is, if it did, then the isometry group would have to be So with respect to that positively curved metric would have to be finite. Or is finite dimensional. Okay. So this motivated uh, Karsten to investigate a problem like this. And um, we've gotten a lot of use out of this objective. So for example, one of the notions of large isometry group is that the rank of the isometry group is large. So we're going to call that the symmetry rank for our Ramanian manifold. The symmetry rank is, is the rank of the isometry, which can be um, thought of as the maximal dimension of a torus that acts isometrically and effectively in our manifold. And so uh, Grove and Searle proved that if you have a positively curved manifold, the symmetry rank is bounded above by roughly half the dimension. So this is the floor function, which is the largest integer that's less than or equal to n plus 1 over 2. So the symmetry rank is roughly half the dimension. And uh, equality holds, so you have maximal symmetry rank if and only if the manifold is one of these manifolds here. Okay. And it's easy enough to see these examples if I think of an odd dimensional sphere as being in the appropriate dimension complex space, the unit sphere in there. Then I have an n-dimensional torus action, which is given by, I think, of all of those complex planes.
and the cross sections of the sphere in each of those complex planes is going to be circles that are centered around the origin. And then I can have an S1 acting on each of those circles independently. Okay, this is just the linear uh, torus, the n dimensional torus action on uh, n dimensional complex space by multiplication in each factor. And then for the uh, even dimensional sphere, you just take the, the suspension of this action. So you, you add a factor of R and nothing happens in that factor of R. Okay. Another result in this uh, line of inquiry is due to Wilking. So Wilking proved that if I have simply connected manifold uh, in dimensions eight or greater, if they have positive sectional curvature, and we weaken the symmetry rank assumption. So we're not saying that the symmetry rank is roughly half the dimension. We're going to say it's roughly fourth the dimension. Then the manifold is homeomorphic to a sphere or quaternionic projective space, or it's homotopy equivalent to a complex projective space. OK, so uh, there were lots of different tools that, that Wilking used. And we're going to talk about one of them today, which is called the connectedness principle. And um, that is. Uh, really useful to, for taking fixed point sets of actions and getting topological information out of them when you have positive sectional curvature. Okay, so now what we're going to talk about is taking uh, this program and asking, well, what if I, instead of looking at positively curved manifolds, what if I weaken that condition? So we're going to look at positive intermediate Ricci curvature. Uh, okay, right. So there's the question. Can we classify manifolds of positive intermediate Ricci curvature that have large tor symmetries? So what is positive intermediate Ricci curvature? First, let's remind ourselves what Ricci curvature is. So given a unit vector in your manifold, the Ricci curvature, the Ricci uh, 0, 2 tensor applied to that uh, vector is going to be the trace of this operator where this is the um, 1, 3 curvature tensor. And when you take the trace of that, that boils down to a sum of sectional curvatures. So notice that u is kept constant in this sum, and the vi's are vectors that are orthogonal to u in all, all unit vectors as well. Okay. So the idea is to, instead of get an, a whole orthonormal basis for your uh, tangent space and look at the sum of sectional curvatures, what we're going to do is look at a, a partial frame of your uh, tangent space and look at the sum of the appropriate sum of sectional curvatures. So again, u is kept constant in this sum of sectional curvatures. So given a k between one and one minus the dimension of the manifold, positive k -th intermediate Ricci curvature uh, is what we have when we take any set of orthonormal vectors, u v1 up to vk. We look at the sum of sectional curvatures. And it's positive. So, for example, if I want to look at Ricci two positive, then what I need is three vectors: u, v one, v two. I'm going to take the plane spanned by u and v one, call that p one. Take the plane spanned by u and v two, call that p two. And then the condition says that the sectional curvature of p one plus the sectional curvature of P2 has to be positive. And uh, I guess I should say for any um, not, any people that aren't um, don't use Ramanian geometry regularly, um, so the sectional curvature, you can think of the Gaussian curvature of the appropriate um, totally geodesic sub uh, surface inside of your manifold. So I take a plane in my tangent space, exponentiate it into my manifold, and look at the Gaussian curvature of the, that surface. OK, so uh, the notation that we're going to use is Ricci sub k is positive when we have positive kth intermediate Ricci curvature. Are there any questions so far? We are going to talk about some examples next. All right. So um, just in, 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 um, laying out exactly what, what the condition says. So this is the definition written again. And notice that if Ricci k is equal to 1, then that says that sexual curvatures are positive. In this case, this sum has only one sum and, and it's just saying that all, all of those uh, sexual curvatures are positive. 
if k is equal to n minus 1, then this is just the sum of sexual curvatures we saw for Ricci curvature. So we have positive Ricci curvature. And if I have Ricci k is positive, then for any l greater than or equal to k, Ricci l will be positive. So we have sectional curvature is our strongest condition, Ricci curvature is our weakest. All right? So what are some examples? So let's say I have uh, two positively curved manifolds, m and n. I uh, equip them with, uh, equip the product of them with the product metric and ask what intermediate region curvatures am I going to have being positive? And uh, Ricci k is going to be positive for the product manifold um, when k is greater than or equal to the maximum of the dimensions plus 1. OK, so for example, if I take a look at S3 cross S3 with the product metric, that's going to have Ricci 4 positive. And that's easy enough to see. And you won't have Ricci 3 positive. Because if I take a look at the tangent spaces, so I decompose the tangent space into the appropriate tangent spaces for the spheres. If I choose one vector u to be in this tangent space, on the tangent space to one factor, I can choose v1, v2, and v3 to be in the opposite factor. And then the sectional curvature of u with vi is going to be equal to 0. Okay, and that's because the, the um, curvature tensor splits whenever you have a, a Ramanian product like this. But by pigeon, pigeonhole principle, we know that when we have to fit in a fourth vector, a fourth um, orthogonal vector, we'll have to fit into this factor, and we're going to have positive sexual curvature there. Okay, so the sum of these, uh, all four of these sectional curvatures is positive. All right. Another source of examples is Ramanian submersions. And I don't think too many people are, are um, aware of this idea for intermediate reach curvature. But um, if I have a Ramanian submersion, so a Ramanian submersion is a submersion. So let's take a look at the tangent space of the domain, tangent space of the base. That's going to have a kernel. It's a uh, differential is going to have a kernel. And if I take the orthogonal complement of the kernel, then a Ramanian submersion is a submersion such that the inner product of these vectors is going to be the same as the inner product of their projections. So the same inner product. Okay. And O'Neill um, is the one who came up with the fundamental equations of the curvature for Ramanian submersions. And um, in particular, when you look at the appropriate um, sectional curvatures, you see that for vectors in the orthogonal complements of the kernel, we call those horizontal vectors um, based on the picture that I drew. Then the sectional curvature downstairs is greater than or equal to the sectional curvature upstairs. And the difference is. Um, a term dealing with the with what's called the A-tensor, the O'Neill A-tensor. Anyway, the important thing is that we have this inequality. So if I have Ricci K positive upstairs, and that K is um, at most the dimension of the base minus 1, then Ricci K will be positive downstairs. So for example, I could take a look at um, S3 cross S3 with this product metric. And if I have, uh, if I choose any free circle action, then its quotient, let me write it like this. If I take a look at its quotient, that will be a five dimensional manifold. And because the dimension of the base is five, oops, sorry. If the dimension of the base is five, while I have reach you four of S3 cross S3 positive. We see that this 
uh, five dimensional base space admits Ricci four positive as well. Which, oops, sorry. Which in dimension five just means it has positive Ricci curvature. So for example, uh, so you get S2 cross S3 um, from this example, which is um, not that surprising because with, with its product metric that has positive Ricci curvature, but you also get the uh, non-trivial S3 bundle over S2. Admitting positive Ricci curvature, which um, this is a, a, a neat way of seeing that that's the case. Um, and, and I don't think that that's super obvious just by looking at the manifold. OK. And for my last bit of examples, um, I want to talk about some examples I came up with recently during my thesis work. And uh, these are examples of Cheeger deformations. So suppose I have a positively curved manifold that is homogeneous where my, uh, I have a transitive isometric group action by a Lie group G. Then their product, the product of M with itself, admits a metric with Ricci 2 positive. Okay. And the idea here is I have um, my manifold with its product metric. And I can take a look at the diagonal G action on the product of M with itself. And what I can do is, with respect to this G action, I can do what, what we call a Cheeger deformation. And Cheeger deformations are ways of taking manifolds with um, uh, continuous isometric Lie group actions. And you shrink each of the orbits systematically. And um, in the limit, it would um, reduce down to the orbit space with its orbital metric. Um, and when you do this Cheeger deformation, then this product with the Cheeger deformed metric is going to have a Ricci 2 positive. Whereas uh, this product uh, with its product metric, this only had Ricci n plus 1 positive. OK, so this is a vast improvement on intermediate Ricci curvatures. If I have a 100-dimensional manifold, this product would have Ricci 101 positive. But if you Cheeger deform, it immediately has Ricci 2 positive. OK, so the idea behind this is to take a look in the tangent space. And I have the factor associated to um, so the factor of the tangent space associated to one factor of M. And then I have the other factor of M. And then I also have the diagonal uh, G action orbit. Okay, and a plane is going to be uh, is going to have zero sectional curvature only if its projection onto all three of these is non-degenerate as a plane. So, really, the uh, the only situation where I could have zero curvature and and instead of positive curvature is if my plane looks something like this, and if I project it onto any of these spaces, I end up with something like a line. So these are the only planes with zero sectional curvature. OK? So the reason I bring this up is this, this is going to be a useful example going forward, because um, we're going to talk about uh, this example in the context of spheres and, and the torus actions that they have on them. All right. So I said that we're going to study positive intermediate region curvature with uh, torus actions. So let's talk about it. So uh, Berger has the following um, tool that's really useful in uh, positive sectional curvature. If I have a closed even dimensional manifold and the sectional curvature is positive, 
then any killing field on that manifold is going to have a zero. Now, a killing field is a vector field whose flows are by isometries. So the easiest way to get a killing field is to have an isometric group action. Take a look at the associated action field. So for example, I could have, um, so X, your killing field could be the action field of an S1 action, of an isometric S1 action. And then what this theorem says is that the fixed point set of your S1 action on the manifold is going to be non-empty because the, the action field is going to have a zero somewhere, and that's where you, you have a fixed point. So for example, if I have S1 acting on S2, that's an even dimensional positive curve manifold. So that's rotation about the Z axis, if you like. I'm going to have the north and south pole fixed while my, the rest of my action field is going to look like that. Okay. So that's great for even dimensional manifolds. What about in odd dimensions? Well, in uh, odd dimensions, uh, we have the corresponding statement that was proven by Sugihara, uh, which says that closed odd dimensional positively curved manifolds, if they have two commuting killing fields, um, then they must be linearly dependent at some point. So that says if I have a T2 action, then there's going to be a subgroup that is a circle so that the fixed point set of that circle is not empty. Okay. And this was also uh, discovered independently by uh, Grove and Searle. Okay, namely they, they phrased it using torus actions um, rather than killing fields. But I wanna bring up the killing field um, side of the story because that's exactly what we're gonna generalize. Okay. So for positive intermediate Ricci curvature, we have the following tool going forward. If I have a closed manifold with positive intermediate Ricci curvature, the GK is positive. Then if I have uh, any K plus one commuting killing fields, they must be linearly independent at some point. Okay. Um, so for example, notice that this generalizes Sugihara's uh, statement. In that case, K is equal to one. So I have uh, Ricci one is positive, which is positive sexual curvature. And then I would have two commuting killing fields in that case. And they must be linearly independent. Um, Another thing to, to point out is that we don't have dimension parity. And um, the reason we don't have dimension parity, it's not that I don't have uh, counterexamples, it's that um, Berger was able to exploit something um, that's really nice. So what this boils down to is if uh, your killing field is X, what Berger showed was that um, at a minimum of the length of the, the function that is the length of x. The uh, covariant derivative is a skew symmetric operator. And if I take a look at the kernel of this, it contains the vector x itself at the minimum. So a skew symmetric operator on an even dimensional space is going to have uh, even dimensional kernel. So that means there exists a V that's in the kernel. That's also orthogonal to X. Okay. And that is um, what allows you to get a, um, a zero curvature plane. And I guess I haven't explained why that's the case. So let me, um, let me say why that's the case. So for this example, <clears throat> for, sorry, for this proposition, let's say I have x, y1, up to yk, commuting killing fields. Okay. Then what I do is I let f be 1 half the length of the projection. Oh, sorry. 1 half the length of the projection of x onto 
the orthogonal complement of everything else, all the other vectors. Squared. Okay. And then where we have, uh, let's say that these vector fields are linearly independent everywhere, then I would have a positive, um, a positive minimum at some point. And I can arrange myself so that at that positive minimum, the Hessian of, of this function is going to be equal to the following expression. So in Berger's case, there's uh, less stuff to keep track of. So this Hessian is actually much nicer in that case. Namely, this term isn't here, the term that I'm writing right now. And so at a positive minimum, this Hessian is going to be uh, non-negative. OK. And like I said, if they're linearly independent, we'll have a positive minimum somewhere. So um, Berger showed that um, we're going to have a vector that's orthogonal to x that's in the kernel of this. And again, he doesn't have this term in his result. So that means that this term is going to be 0 for that uh, choice of v, which means that this curvature is going to have to be non-positive. Which is which contradicts your positive sectional curvature assumption. Okay. And the general setting for positive intermediate Ricci curvature, what we have to do is find a, a selection of vectors v i. So we find v1 up to vk, such so that this is uh, non positive. Right. So if that is non-positive, then the uh, corresponding curvatures, which is um, uh, this amounts to sectional curvatures here, when you choose your v's and x's right, uh, the corresponding curvatures are going to have to be non-positive as well. So that when we get when we subtract, we get something non-negative. Okay. All right. So this gives us a new tool because it allows us to get fixed point sets of torus actions. Let me remind myself what my next slide looks like. Okay. All right. And I'll point out that, so I'm going to, I'm going to, um, does anybody have any questions before I, I guess, let me, let me move this text up for a second. Ah, I'm not going to do that. Let me just point out that <clears throat> in some cases you can't do better than this. For example, let me just write in a different color. If I take a look at the Cheeger deformed metric on S3 cross S3 that I talked about earlier, then in that case, uh, we actually have free T2 actions. We have free two torus actions. So this shows that in that um, for k equal to one, uh, sorry, for k equal to two, I cannot replace this k plus one with just k. Okay, I can't have two communicating fields guarantee uh, and guarantee that they are linearly independent somewhere, linearly dependent somewhere. All right. So. How can we use this tool? Well, Grove and Searle proved the, that we have a um, upper bound on symmetry rank, which is the dimension of a torus that can act isometrically, using um, the, their result that if you have a two torus action, then there must be an S1 that um, has a non empty fixed point set. So, building on that, we can get symmetry rank bounds for positive intermediate Ricci curvature. Okay. And notice that when reaching k is positive for k less than or equal to 3, so that's the stronger of the um, curvature conditions, then we have the exact same upper bound for symmetry rank as Grove and Searle do. So all of the, their examples that have maximal symmetry rank um, apply here as well. And also, um, when we have a weaker curvature condition, this is the symmetry rank bound that we have. 
So um, some examples. So we have all, all of the same examples that have positive sectional curvature, but we also have S2 cross S2 with their product metric that has Ricci 3 positive and the symmetry rank is equal to two, which is four plus one over two with the floor function. Okay, so that has maximal symmetry rank. We also have S3 cross S3 with its product metric has Ricci 4 positive. And the symmetry rank in this case is equal to 4, which is 6 plus 4 over 2 floor minus 1. And then if you Cheeger deform this, so we have S3 cross S3 with this Cheeger deform metric that has Ricci 2 positive. In that case, the symmetry rank is equal to three. You only lose um, one circle's worth of symmetry. And that is also maximal. In that case, we have um, the symmetry rank bound is six plus one over two with the floor function. Okay. Now, what um, plays into this is results by Pack and Parker, and these are topological results. Um, and they prove, uh, they, they classify cohomogeneity one torus actions on, on um, manifolds. And in particular, uh, they show that the, uh, or a consequence is that the fundamental group has to be infinite in each of these cases for uh, dimensions four or higher. <clears throat> so in particular, that shows because of Meyer's theorem. This, this shows that the symmetry rank of a um, Ricci positive uh, manifold has to be uh, in minus two or less. Okay. And I should point out that um, Fernando and Diego Coro um, have proven, so the, the, the question is, can we reach n minus two? Can we, can we have Ricci positive manifolds with symmetry rank equal to n minus two? And so far, I think this is the best effort, which is that uh, symmetry rank equal to n minus four with Ricci positive. Uh, in all dimensions is, po is possible. Oops. Oh, sorry. Okay. Man, I keep uh, hitting something on my tablet. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, and I think it's, it's easy enough to come up with examples that have symmetry rank equal to n minus two up to dimension six. And I think in dimension seven is where it starts becoming um, uh, an issue of whether or not we have examples or not. All right. So this, um, I think I'm going to go ahead and, and skip this. This is um, just going to be essentially using Groven Searle's um, argument for, which is a bit of a, a, a an induction argument. Essentially, the base cases are um, you use Pack and Parker to show that the symmetry rank is bounded above by these quantities. And then what you do is you get fixed point sets of your torus action, and you um, show that if the torus is large enough, those fixed point sets have to be in large dimension. If it's too large, the fixed point set is the whole manifold, and, and your, your action is actually ineffective. Because I'd like to move on from here to our next tool which um, I alluded to earlier, which is the uh, connectedness principle. So Wilking proved the following connectedness principle. Um, it's typically phrased for positively curved manifolds because that's all it's been used for as far as I'm aware. Um, but Wilking does remark that it does work for positive intermediate Ricci curvature. And um, it says the following. If I have a compact Riemannian manifold and Ricci K is positive, 
if I have an uh, n minus d dimensional compact, totally geodesic embedded submanifold, then the inclusion is going to be n minus 2d plus 2 minus k connected. OK, and what that means is that if I take a look at the appropriate um, homotopy groups or homology groups, cohomology groups, you get um, you get isomorphisms. Oops. Yeah. And you get either an injection or a surjection when I is equal to that upper bound. And I always forget which one it is. OK. But um, so this is the result for intermediate Ricci curvature. And let me say a little bit about um, how that's proven. So the idea is um, to realize that if I take a look at the path space for n inside of the manifold m, so these are all the paths that start and end in n, then n can be embedded into that path space by the constant uh, curves. Okay, and I can define an energy functional on this space. All right, define the energy functional, which is the integral of one half the square of the speed of these curves. Okay, and the idea is to show that this inclusion is has a certain level of connectedness and from that you get that the um, inclusion of n into m has a certain amount of connectedness okay and the idea is that gamma is a critical point if and only if gamma is a geodesic that starts and uh, ends perpendicular to n So I have my submanifold in, I have my critical point. And then the idea is how can I vary this uh, geodesic? How can I vary this critical point of the en energy functional using other geodesics that are perpendicular to n? So you construct um, vector field, you, can, you choose vectors that are tangent to n and are linearly independent. Then you parallel transport them around. So that how many of these are there? There's going to be n minus d of them. You do a, a parallel transport, and then you end up with some of them being tangent to n in the end. So how many of them um, might you lose? Well, you might end up losing. Uh, so when you parallel transport, they're going to be perpendicular to the geodesic. But um, some of them could end up uh, outside of n. So there could be um, maybe d minus 1 missing after you parallel trust work, missing from the tangent space to n. OK, so in total, the um, parallel vector fields that are tangent to n at the beginning and the end are going to be n minus uh, 2d plus 1 parallel vector fields. Okay, and then the idea is that the second variation of the energy functional is equal to minus the integral of the curvature of one of these fields with the velocity vector. Okay, and if you have positive curvature, so if I have this as sectional curvature, then this is going to be strictly negative. Okay, so for each wow. one of these um, vector fields v, which there are n minus 2d plus 1 of them, um, I'm going to have a variation of this geodesic that um, for which the um, the index, it, it, we, we add to the index of this geodesic. So the um, energy is going to only decrease. Okay. So um, I want to point out that Wilking also 
improves upon this in positive sectional curvature when you have a Lie group acting and um, fixing the manifold in pointwise. And uh, the idea here is to uh, use that symmetry to your advantage. But in his argument, he does a bit of a Cheeger deformation, and it's critical in, in, during the Cheeger deformation that you preserve the positive sectional curvature. And um, if you try to do the corresponding argument for positive intermediate Ricci curvature, um, you don't know that positive intermediate Ricci curvature go, um, continues as, as you Cheeger deform. So um, this, his argument doesn't generalize for positive intermediate Ricci curvature. Um, so what I managed to do is prove the corresponding um, statement for positive intermediate Ricci curvature. So it's the same uh, connectedness, but you're losing just as much um, connectedness as your um, curvature condition gets weaker, just as you do up here. And uh, the idea, oops, sorry, the idea is to build off of um, work by Giharo and Wilhelm, which is their soft connectedness principle paper, where um, instead of using parallel vector fields along the um, geodesic, what you use is variations by Jacobi fields. And then they do this uh, Jacobi field comparison um, that, that exploits Wilking's uh, transverse Jacobi equation. Okay, so I won't really get into the details of, of that right now. But the important thing is that we have this tool that we can use. Um, I should ask, what, what time should I aim to, to stop talking? In like five, five minutes, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, so we have this tool that we can use. So let me remind you what Grove and Searle um, said. They showed that if the symmetry rank is roughly half the dimension, then the manifold is diffeomorphic to a sphere of complex projective space if you're simply connected. Wilking showed that if the symmetry rank is roughly a fourth of the dimension, you can add quaternionic projective space to your list. And in odd dimensions, I've managed to show that if you have symmetry rank, uh, if you have maximal symmetry rank for Ricci two positive, so we're, this is the, the next weakest, uh, or it's the strongest intermediate Ricci curvature that's not positive sexual curvature. Um, if you have maximal symmetry rank, or if you have symmetry rank roughly three eighths the dimension, then um, your manifold must be homeomorphic to a, a sphere. Now, um, the idea here is you have a large um, torus action. You end up with a sub torus. That's uh, co dimension two with non empty fixed point set. Okay. And um, there's going to be, so you, you play around with the dimension, the possible dimensions of these fixed point sets. So there's going to be a component of um, a fixed point set of some circle sub action that's going to have co dimension um, n over four. So let's say it's roughly equal to um, n divided by four. Okay, and um, what happens then is that the um, inclusion. So if this is the component, so let's let's choose a component inside this fixed point set. The inclusion is going to be um, roughly n over two connected. Okay. And you can show that the symmetry rank of this, um, so this, uh, sorry, this submanifold is going to also have positive Ricci two. It's going to have large enough symmetry rank, namely, it's going to have um, three eighths of dimension symmetry rank. And so you can apply uh, induction on this, and um, with this connectedness, um, all of these uh, homologies, uh, all the homologies for n are going to be zero. All of the non-trivial ones are going to be zero. So then you can push zeros around the homologies of M as well. And you show that it's a um, simply connected um, homology sphere, which means that it's going to be homeomorphic to a sphere. Okay. And 
so that's the situation in even dimensions. And I think that this can be approved upon by um, looking at involutions instead of uh, circle subactions of this, um, but I'm still working on the details for that. And for um, uh, even dimensions, um, the situation is a little um, stickier. If I have an even dimensional manifold, there's a, the Hopf conjecture says that positively curved even dimensional manifolds have positive order characteristic. There's been lots of um, partial results toward this using torus symmetry. And I think the most promising is the following by Kennard, um, Weimler, and Wilking. And if I have a closed connected even dimensional manifold with symmetry rank greater than or equal to five, then the um, Euler characteristic should be positive. And I, th I think that there might be a little bit of a, a lie in how I stated this, but um, I don't think this is on archive or anything yet. So I'm not sure exactly how to phrase it um, to be completely accurate. But um, I've managed to prove that if you have a closed, simply connected, even dimensional manifold, again, Ricci 2 positive, that's the, the next step down from sectional curvature. If the symmetry rank is greater than um, a fourth of the dimension, the Euler characteristic um, has to be positive. Okay, and then again, you, you play the same sort of game. You have a, um, a large uh, torus action, you end up with fixed point sets. You can actually get a, a tower of fixed point sets of different circle sub, subgroups and torus subgroups of your group action. And then you can um, play around until you end up with um, your homology having exactly what it, what it needs. So you push zeros through the, the um, odd homologies of your manifold. Okay, so uh, instead of talking about the proof of this, I'll just end with it, an example. So um, if I have odd dimensional spheres, then, um, and I take a look at the Cheeger deform metric on those odd dimensional spheres, then I actually have Tn, let me see if I have the dimension right. Yeah, Tn plus one acts isometrically on these. And in this case, n plus one is equal to the dimension plus six over four. So that shows that um, because the Euler characteristic of course is equal to zero, that shows that this result is in fact sharp. You can't weaken the symmetry rank um, assumption. Okay, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you all.